Today, we're going to learn about the following topics. Um, here's what we're going to learn about today. So, you probably have come here possibly as an endangered language enthusiast, or possibly you have no desire to learn any endangered language whatsoever, but maybe there's just simply some curiosity you really have about the process. And so, uh, the first question, what is an endangered language? That's uh, significantly important. And then afterwards, we're going to learn what sort of reasons do people have for learning endangered languages. Next up, is learning an endangered language to fluency possible? And then the short answer is yes. And the reasons why some people think it isn't, I'm going to respectfully disagree with them and show you why I think that they're mistaken. If you want to learn an endangered language, where do you look and how do you begin? Then what makes learning an endangered language different from learning a global language like German or Mandarin Chinese or a safe national language like Bulgarian or Somali? What traps do learners of endangered languages fall into and how can you avoid them? Can learning an endangered language as an outsider help keep the language alive? The short answer is yes. Ways you can help preserve endangered languages even if you have no intention to learn them. And so probably you're curious a little bit about myself. And so here I am in Nuuk, Greenland, and then right behind me is Katua, which is the, it's the culture house. It's a bit like a performance space plus movie theater, um, cafe, and artistic, it's, uh, artistic show space. And uh, here I am in October, and right behind me you see an icy road. And so probably very curious exactly who I am, why I'm presenting on this topic. Um, for those of you who have read my blog, worldwithlittleworlds.com, you probably know a little bit about me. Uh, chances are you may also be seeing this video and hearing my voice for the first time, which is also great. Welcome. Uh, I'm one of very few online polyglots whose first fluent language was an endangered language, and that was Yiddish. It was the first language I learned to fluency as an adult, and it was and is a tremendously important language for me, given how much it generally influenced not only my family story, but also the history of Jews in America and American popular culture at large. Another journey of mine with another endangered language, Greenlandic, which is listed by UNESCO's Atlas of the World Languages in Danger as being vulnerable. We're going to actually show that atlas on the next slide. Actually led me to creating an RPG set in contemporary Greenland, uh, covering new adventures. It's due for release later this year. And uh, in some of my interviews from last year, I actually said it was coming out in late 2017, but there's going to be a delay. But don't worry about it. It is coming out, and it's going to be truly fantastic. You're going to be able to explore cartoon Greenland as a cute animal character, lots of humor, lots of internet-style dialogues and what have you. It's truly not going to be something you forget ever. Um, some endangered languages I speak fluently, such as Yiddish, others I've forgotten, such as Northern Sami, others I plan to learn later this year, Tuvalu and others I primarily use in a passive context, such as Cornish. I also speak a host of other languages that are less commonly taught, such as primarily Creole languages from Oceania. And it's very interesting because um, I've noticed that I've developed a set of strategies from languages from the developing world and also endangered languages, regardless of whether they're from the developing or the developed world. And surprisingly, there's actually a lot of overlap in the strategies that you really need to adopt in order to become fluent in these languages. And um, yes, I've tried to get enthusiastic about some global languages, but part of me always feels a detachment to most of, most of them. And my passion is really always a, the little guy. And it's it's okay if you feel that way too, or if you like bigger languages, uh, that's also perfectly acceptable. Okay, so a little bit more about what is an endangered language. So on the right here, we have the UNESCO Atlas of the World's Languages in Danger. The white pins indicate a language that is vulnerable, that may be falling out of use within the younger generation. And then the red pins, on the other hand, indicate critically endangered which means that the primary speakers of this language are senior citizens, and even among them, the language is falling out of use. The black pins indicate a language that is no longer living, and then the yellow and orange pins indicate definitely and severely endangered, respectively. And so back to the question as to what an endangered language actually is. So throughout the world, we've had empires and states that seek to impose their cultures and way of life on others. And so throughout the creation of many, if not all of these states, two things tend to happen. One, sometimes governments actively suppress languages that they see as a barrier towards unifying their nation or consolidating their supremacy. 
Uh, as an American myself, I obviously have been very aware of the fact that many Native Americans uh, have not only been subject to genocide, but also many of them have been were put in schools set up by the American government or to really punish them for using their native languages or expressing any variety of their native cultures as well. And so as a result right here in the United States, we usually have a big chunk of languages that are very definitely endangered. Um, and certainly the United States is not unique in this regard. As you can see, all of the continents throughout the entire world are also affected by language death. Uh, one important thing to keep in mind is that uh, concerning endangered languages, there are a lot more languages are endangered in the world by a large margin than biological species are endangered, both among plants and animals. Second, sometimes people raise their children to speak another more powerful language better so that their descendants have more economic opportunities or don't get teased in school or fit in better. And um, so let's go ahead and introduce you to a list of endangered languages that I've learned to varying degrees throughout my life and how they fit into this paradigm. And so there are going to be a lot of sad stories that are really told with a lot of these languages, but you're actually going to see a genuine pattern in this understanding that languages do not die by themselves. And more important, languages do not die because there's something wrong with them. This is just a misunderstanding. And so uh, Yiddish, Breton, Cornish, Tuvaluan, the Sami languages, Greenlandic and Faroese, um, Irish, Welsh, and Scottish Gaelic. Okay, so uh, on with Yiddish. On the left side here we have Dos Bletala, which is a, in Sweden, where very interestingly Yiddish is an uh, official language of the state. And you can actually like cast your ballots um, that are fully written in Yiddish, and also a number of educational um, pamphlets and what have you are also available um, in Yiddish as well. And so in the United States, a lot of Ashkenazi Jewish immigrants wanted to learn English instead of uh, Yiddish, and often Yiddish publications in the 1920s and also uh, earlier in like the um, late 19th century served to turn Yiddish speakers into English speakers. And so countless young Jews in the United States have had grandparents who spoke Yiddish but didn't pass it on to their children. So within Israel, Yiddish was actively suppressed in favor of Hebrew until recent decades. The Holocaust also wiped out huge swaths of Yiddish culture, especially those whose adherents were poor people. While most Holocaust survivors emigrated primarily to Israel, North America, or other Brit or British Commonwealth countries. Um, Yiddish was seen largely as secondary to the local languages of these places, both among those who stayed in Europe and those who moved elsewhere. Next up we have Breton, which is a language which some people consider actually having had the most drastic drop in speakers in all of human history. And so on the left here we actually have no one that was um, hit song, a Matolo, which is a song about the three sailors. And you can actually see here that it is upwards, as of the time of me speaking, upwards of nine million views. And this is a song you may actually have heard before. And it's uh, one with very, very deep cultural and historical roots um, to the Breton sailing culture. Um, for the linguistic unity of France, it is necessary that the Breton language disappear. So these are quotes from um, people who were made to implement French governmental policy. And I'll go ahead and read them out loud, and then I'll actually explain that um, Brittany was a place where about 150 years ago, the vast majority of people really spoke Breton as a first language. But as a result of processes set in place by the French government over the course of the 20th century, that entire area has really been converted into a majority French speaking area, uh, with the exception of maybe some areas of the countryside and among uh, older people as well. And yes, there obviously are some schools that really are. Their primary purpose is to get uh, kids speaking Breton, but obviously there are many of things that are not in their favor for many, many reasons. Um, some other sources from this, uh, if I recall correctly, is a bilingual French Breton website. Um, there is no place for regional languages and culture in a France that must make its mark upon Europe. A rule that I would never bend, not a rule of Breton, neither in the class nor at recess. Keep in mind, gentlemen, that you have been put in place in order to kill the Breton language, or only been put in place in order to kill the Breton language. So this was a deliberate effort, this understanding, again, languages do not die by themselves. 
Okay, uh, Cornish, and then here we actually have a, a video game, of course, you can see it's a bit of a Space Invaders clone, and yes, you can actually play this game online for free. Um, it's another Celtic language of clone law. It's closely related to Breton in its vocabulary, but closely related to Welsh in its pronunciation. And so, Cornish is the distinction of having died once, and literally have had no native speakers remaining, in part because of the imposition of English language liturgy on Cornwall as a result of the English Reformation. Uh, onwards, we have uh, Tuvaluan, and here we have memorized courses in Tuvaluan. Uh, Tuvalu is a former British colony, now independent country in the South Pacific, threatened by the presence of English, despite the fact that most Tuvaluans are fluent speakers of the language. Within many of these island countries as well, uh, some of which are not fully independent, such as Tokelau and Niue, both of which are overseas dependencies of New Zealand, and also Rapa Nui, which you may know as Easter Island, their languages are designated as endangered in part because they are bis siege to the, the presence of English or Spanish in the case of Easter Island. And the Sami languages are uh, very similar to the story of the Native Americans in terms of cultural erasure in many regards, although yes there have been some efforts in order to actually it, create revivals of the culture in many of the languages as well that many of these governments once very much guilty of this cultural erasure are actually making amends for so spoken in the northern areas of what is now Norway Sweden Finland and Russia respective governments of these places try to eradicate Sami culture punish children for speaking these languages and try to convert them culturally to their own national standards uh, Greenlandic um, imposition of the Danish language on Greenland during colonial time with a longer term plans once in place to erase the Greenlandic languages permanently. And so, um, yet again, we also really find a lot of this aspect uh, present within states that really want to consolidate their rule and convert people whom they colonized to their linguistic identity. And then on to the possibly the best known and most studied endangered languages, we have Irish, Welsh, and Scottish Gaelic. And so here we have the flag of the Celtic nations. We have uh, Galicia in the upper left-hand corner, and then going um, from the top, the going, oh, let's see, I, I, I never get this right. Uh, going clockwise, we have uh, Ireland, Scotland, Cornwall, uh, the Isle of Man, Wales, and Brittany. And so these Celtic languages are, um, well, Galician is actually a Romance language, but um, very interestingly, uh, the rest of them are Celtic languages, and there are two sets of three siblings, with Cornish, Welsh, and Breton as discussed being siblings, the Brythonic languages, and then the Gaelic languages of Irish, Scottish, Gaelic, and Manx also being siblings. Okay, so now you're probably wondering what sort of reasons do people have for learning endangered languages. So one is cultural heritage, and understanding that their ancestors spoke this language. Even if they don't intend to learn the language to fluency, they can engage with the culture on some grounds and feel connected to it. Some people may even have writings from their ancestors written in that language or may seek to connect to elderly relatives while they're still living. Altruism, perhaps wanting to help stem the tide of massive language death in some communities. Some scholars may say that outside learners of endangered languages may not help that situation, but I completely disagree with that notion and I'm going to provide more information about that later. Uh, travel, sometimes you may find yourself somewhere where an endangered language is spoken, even by a minority, for example in English speaking areas of Ireland where many of the signs are bilingual in Irish and in English. And for example, if you've been to the airport in Dublin, you'd actually really notice that even if you're primarily hearing English spoken in the terminal, the signs are actually written in English and in Irish, and if I recall correctly, when I was there last, um, the Irish was written in a very, very distinct green font, and it was very noticeable everywhere. And so learning such a language, even if it prominently isn't spoken there, may enable you not only to notice things that most travelers don't, but may also give you the usual routine of free drinks and making friends with significant ease. Like in some places, I I Ireland is one place and Brittany is another, uh, some people actually wear badges that indicate that they're fluent speakers speakers so that people can identify them on site and then switch to the endangered language. Sometimes some of these badges are actually color coded to indicate levels of fluency as well. Business opportunities. Endangered languages are very much of a glass cannon in terms of employment opportunities and freelancing. Knowledge of them may not be too appreciated at your local language social, but in the right community, your knowledge of a language like Cornish could mean guaranteed employment. And so very interestingly, if you really want to go ahead and live in Cornwall, go ahead and learn Cornish and see how many um, 
Cornish speaking jobs are really available there. Given how a lot of people throughout the globe have really written off the Cornish language very sadly as useless, this means more opportunities for you and you could actually really find yourself in a fantastic uh, teaching position or maybe something concerning the radio or what have you that you didn't even think possible. It's like almost cheating. And go ahead and try that out. Artistic opportunities. Especially in the endangered languages in the developed world, there is an artistic boom in which a lot of independent music, television, and YouTube series are being created. Learning the language and entering the sphere can guarantee you friends and artistic exposure with significant ease. And so not only are we really living in a world in which uh, songs in endangered languages win the Eurovision Song Contest and are featured in Disney films. I'm not talking about Let It Go translated in different languages. For those unaware, uh, Moana or Vayana actually featured songs that were partially written in Tokelauan, which was one of the islands that I mentioned earlier back. It has about 3,000 native speakers. And yet again, it was featured in a huge blockbuster film. Also, one thing I really noticed... Uh, um, for those of you who know my story, I actually learned Spanish and Russian in high school, and then in college, I actually really started to learn Yiddish, and it being, again, the first uh, fluent language that I learned as an adult. And one thing I really noticed in comparison to the learning processes was the fact that in the Yiddish sphere, I became like almost instant friends with anyone who even like spoke a little bit. And um, the community was so unbelievably well-connected that we were really always willing to help each other up to become friends, to really help each other really become fluent. Learning an endangered language gives you instant insider premium privileges, and that's truly something that you wouldn't be able to experience until you even begin learning an endangered language, and that's one thing that really makes it fantastically rewarding. Is learning an endangered language to fluency possible? And the short answer is yes, and some reasons as to why some people don't believe that are going to be debunked very shortly. And so the truth is, is that your dreams with your dream endangered language or even a set of them can come true. However, you will need to significantly increase your volume of study, especially self-study and active activity with the language in order to become better with it. This means that you really need to rehearse speaking, preferably with a recorder or a video, and then publishing that, writing diaries as well, and posting it on Polyglots, the community, and also really ensuring that you make it genuinely a part of your life very, very forcefully and with great passion. And you're going to need to do more of that because in order to really rack up that hour count, you're really going to need to make up for the fact that you're not getting as exposed to this language as often. Uh, social media can definitely help. Rehearse with writing, making videos of yourself speaking, or even impromptu classes that you can feature on a YouTube channel like YouTube or Daily Motion or Tumblr. Uh, if you have a community nearby that speaks the local language, you're in luck. So, for example, I'm um, recording this video in uh, Brooklyn right now. And so in New York City, there are a lot of secular Yiddishists with whom I practice this language. In other areas of the world, I may not have that opportunity as often. So let's take language socials in places like Ireland. Uh, even in English-speaking areas of Ireland, you probably are going to have more people who speak Irish to various degrees than those in North America. And yes, it is very possible to find Irish-speaking opportunities, pretty much any opportunities, in um, in New York City. Yes, I actually have heard languages like uh, Breton and Faroese spoken on the streets here. I'm not, I'm not even joking. Uh, so, cool! What do I do? So... The reason why some people believe that learning an endangered language to fluency isn't possible is because they're attached to this idea that you need the presence of human beings in your life in order to speak it. In the age of the internet, I'm going to say that this is no longer true. The presence of human beings helps, but as long as you have native speaker or fluent speaker input, which could be recordings and very well could be things on the internet, videos or what have you, in both auditory and written forms, as well as ways to actively rehearse active skills, such as writing and speaking, you can do this in order to become fluent in any language with which you have the means of really gaining a basis. And thanks to the internet, it is possible to become conversational or even fluent in a language and go years without native, meeting native speakers. And yes, I have encountered some people who have done that. I've done that. For an endangered language, be prepared to shell out more time and be more creative in your learning methods. And so the more you really spice it up, the more luck you'll have. And so to develop a good relationship with a person, you really can't just simply do the same thing over and over and over again. You just really need to develop a dynamic, loving relationship with that person. And so to the same degree, you'll really need to do that with your dream languages as well. So this is probably one thing you've all been waiting for. If you want to learn an endangered language, where do you look and how do you begin? 
So the Rutledge Colloquial Series is one important thing to start. Some of the various Celtic languages, some of which you can see in the background, are actually available in it, in addition to Basque and Yiddish. Um, not only that, but the audio for these books is available for free online. I actually have a theory that the, um, they actually put the audio for their books available for free on their own websites. Uh, possibly in part to increase sales of the books, but also in part because given how many YouTube tutorials for pronunciation were proliferated, to some degree they couldn't really keep up with that, and so that was a concession. Uh, the Live Lingua project is also significantly important, and the Platinum resource, if you really want to learn languages from the developing world, especially from uh, indigenous languages of South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, various Arabic dialects, or Oceania. And so these books are available for free. A lot of them have become part of the Live Lingua project, thanks to the efforts of the Peace Corps and the Forest Servants Institute. And uh, one thing you really know is that you'll often encounter a lot of these... Um, I'm trying to put it in the words. Um, yeah, the PDFs available for free. Um, and also the public domain. And so you can actually go to various bookstores and have them printed and bound accordingly. And another thing you should also know is that many of them come with audio as well. Uh, for Fr German and French speakers, we have the Weiss Know How or Kautovesh books uh, that are available in, um, I would say, um, Kautovesh's um, series of small books, which include uh, grammar, dictionary, as well as phrase book components. It really gives you a good grounding on the language on multiple regards. They have many endangered languages available in their series, although, again, almost all of them are available only in German, with the exception of German for Foreigners. And uh, one thing to keep in mind is that they have, uh, for example, the Sami languages, they have uh, many of the Celtic languages that you see right behind um, in the background, uh, as well as Sorbian languages, and yes, indigenous languages of the Americas, including Wakota, surprisingly. Uh, Asimil needs no further introduction. And the Omniglot.com's list of resources in the language is very important, because if you look at uh, Omniglot.com's huge database of languages, one thing you'll really notice is that you go to the profile at the bottom, lists of resources will be available for you. Um, many of them are free. In a handful of cases, some of them may be paid. But one thing to definitely know is that if you are making resources available for an endangered language, share them with the site. And they'll go ahead and update it accordingly. Um, this is very, very helpful. Because sometimes one resource that's really, really good and extremely thorough, I kid you not, may be enough in order to give a good, good basis, if not, in fact, uh, outright B2 fluency. Um, memorize Anki and other spaced repetition programs with user-made content. This is a very important one, in part because often there are a lot of books throughout the world that maybe you can't get in your area of the world. So maybe there's that elusive book that's only available in a certain library in the United States or Britain or Germany or what have you. And somebody else who actually has a memorizer or an Anki account has that book and may actually desire to learn that language. And so as a result, he or she may actually go ahead, take all of the sentences and put them in the flashcard program and make it available to the public. And so as a result, a lot of these programs may have materials and sentences and things that can really, really help you that can't be found anywhere else. Um, university libraries, if you have access to them, that's fantastic, and you'll actually be able to find resources that will make your friends wonder, where on earth did you get that? And it's truly fantastic if you can manage that. A transparent languages, transparent languages, transparent language and mango languages are also leading the charge in saving endangered languages as well. Mango languages has a significant amount of the uh, you know, Scottish, Gaelic, Yiddish, and Irish courses are, in my opinion, of good quality. Um, transparent language also has uh, fantastic collections of extremely useful phrases in many languages spanning all of the continents. And what's more, they also have many langu indigenous languages of Canada and the United States, which is extremely useful, and I'm so grateful for the fact that you did this. So thank you very, very much, Transparent Language and Mango Language, and actually everyone on this list. Um, Glossbay.com is also extremely helpful. They actually have a variety of dictionary in which not only some words are translated between two languages, but sometimes, especially to and from English, you'll actually notice that they cross-translate sentences, many of which actually are uh, come from missionary material, and we'll get to that in a moment. So to some degree, you really need to play detective, and so you'll really see cross-translated sentences, and then you can actually 
actually really use this in order to build vocabulary accordingly, or actually maybe there's that one word that always seems to be elusive, and I can't find a textbook to explain it, and so maybe you'll really need that in order to clarify it. Uh, Freelang.com is dozens upon dozens of dictionaries, all available for free with their client. You can actually download free, Freelang quiet, client and also uh, various word lists as well. Those are extremely useful. Many of the dictionaries are extremely thorough, and many of the languages are also very, very rare indeed. If you have trouble finding native speaker audio at first, try searching for music or tutorials on YouTube. Now, otherwise, the Jesus film, which is the 1979 film, is dubbed into more languages than any other in human history. It has been dubbed in, I kid you not, one-sixth of the languages on the planet. And so um, Ari in Beijing actually once referred to me as the language geek's language geek, and I really, really revel in the fact that I've been given this title. But one thing to definitely keep in mind is the fact that when I actually saw the list of languages in which the Jesus film was available, I could barely recognize seven out of every eight on the list. And so this is staggering. If you can't find any resources, ask online Facebook groups, Reddits, forums, or just wait. More materials can and will come out in the future, and even for endangered languages, the material, both free and paid, will continue to grow. And so once you really have a lot of the basis as a combination of these materials, we're going to get into what I call the chessboard theory later on, and the short version is use every single resource you have if you really want to gain fluency. The primary goal from there on out is the same as any other language, learn how to pronounce it, learn basic phrases, learn how to put sentences together with the verbs like to be, to want, to have, etc. Okay, so now on to the next issue. What makes learning an endangered language different from learning a global language like German or Mandarin or a safe national language like Bulgarian or Somali? Technological usage can be scant or non-existent. For a language like Breton, there is Mozilla Firefox, Facebook, Minecraft available in, with a Breton interface. But not all endangered languages are as well endowed, often because corporations want to minimize translation costs. And when, I've actually seen this very consistent pattern in which almost uh, those programs that tend to be available in endangered or minority languages almost always have some variety of co connection to Crowdin, which is a, it's a platform that enables you to actually outsource your localization of volunteer translators. And so Minecraft, for example, uh, is available in many endangered languages as well, as is Facebook, which I believe also has a Klingon language interface, if I recall correctly, in part because instead of paying for translation, you have volunteer translators that really want these programs available in the languages of their dreams. Uh, content online may also be more scarce. This is more relevant for endangered languages from the developing world. Fewer opportunities to meet native speakers in person, depending on where you live, but with apps on the internet, this may change completely, especially if you live in a big city. The fact is that you may actually find your opportunities to meet native speakers, even of very rare languages, especially in big cities, maybe mushrooming in the coming years, and that's a really, really good thing. Fewer resources, which means you'll have to use deductive reasoning and learning from context a lot more often. In some cases where you may have grammar books, some phrases in a dictionary, but not many dedicated textbooks, you may have to make your own phrase book. And so this is my battle plan for Tuvaluan, which I intend to study in the spring, once I actually really get a good grounding on Fijian, which is my current language project. And uh, obviously, if you don't feel too comfortable in making your own sentences, you can e compare it to those in Glospe, for example, the uh, dictionary that I mentioned on the previous slide. Or you could also go to the various national subreddits, and then they can also give you varieties of feedback as well. And so on the internet, uh, you know, yes, it can be very hard to find a lot of these uh, native speakers, but it's certainly not impossible. What traps do learners of endangered languages fall into, and how can you avoid them? One is relying too much on language learning materials rather than using the language in real life. This is huge. A lot of language learners, even of global languages, tend to make this mistake. You primarily need your language learning materials as something to graduate from rather than to become attached to. Not keeping your motivation up or getting discouraged even Yes, some other people may actually be like, why on earth do you want to learn that? But in any case, you really need to be secure in your goal. And this is Jared letting you know that you deserve the language and your dreams in your life. And to be honest, I actually think that most people in the world are actually very open to the idea of learning endangered languages, yet alone the possibility of actually encouraging you to continue with learning an endangered language. And this may actually really spark the curiosity in many regards. And so... 
Motivation is an interesting thing, and so you really need to develop a dynamic relation with the language and culture that you're learning. And if you don't really manage to explore it from many sides or learn a lot of intricate details about it, if you really don't sustain that relationship, then effectively the language that could have become a friend is actually demoted to acquaintance, and then you really won't be able to find the motivation to really keep that relationship going. Relying too much on passive forms of learning and neglect of, act, ne neglect of active forms. So this is a language you don't use actively. This can be absolutely fatal. Not using every available resource. And so I spoke to Luke Truman of Full-Time Fluency about a week and a half ago. And one thing I really mentioned there for the first time in a public interview is the chessboard theory. So the premise goes like this. If you have a chessboard and you want to win the game, you're not going to win very well if your rook and your knight and your bishop is just simply sitting or sitting there together in the corner untouched the whole game. You, in order to win, you need to use every single available resource. The pieces that you have in chess are given for a reason. You need to actually utilize each one in accordance to its strength. And so one result of this is that so your grammar, your music, your television, and your uh, target language, you really need to be using them to maximum effect. And so you can't use just simply one resource over and over and over again and expect to get fluent. That's not going to happen. You're going to really need to create a mixture of different elements in order to really create the lasting relationship and lasting fluency of your dream language. Uh, going to the same materials, even for native speakers, over and over again. Yeah, I've actually seen this. I've sometimes been guilty of it myself. And sometimes, you know, the same five podcasts, the same four movies or what have you. And that could help up until a point that certainly may help with sentence structure in many regards, but also keep in mind that that may leave you equipped to pretty much discuss everything about those particular pieces of art and nothing else. And of course, if the thing that you keep on returning to is a language learning textbook, as is featured in the, the picture, and then that could even spell more trouble. Um, go And lastly, not playing with the language enough or engaging with it with a wide range of activities. So, for example, imagine you're raising a small child, like I've never done this before, but um, often in order to really engage the child, you're going to need to think of a number of different games, really a number of ways to really interact with the child in order to ensure that he or she is not bored. You really need to build a deep relationship with that, and as a result, you need to mix it up. And so really what makes a good relationship is one with many different facets, and you really need to be actively improving a lot of those. And it's the same, building a relationship with a language is very much like building a relationship with a person. The fact that you constantly are on the on the verge of revealing, sharing, and really understanding each other better. And so you really, really need to treat your endangered language as something you very, very deeply love. Okay, next up is, can learning an endangered language as an outsider help keep the language alive? And the short answer is yes. And there are a lot of people, especially scholars, that don't agree. And so there's a fallacy among some academics who think that learners like you and me can't do anything to stem language death that it is secondary to focusing efforts on the community where the dying language is spoken or would be spoken. But the truth of the matter is that every little bit helps. The fact is, is that I know so many people who have been possibly inspired to learn an endangered language by virtue of one song that they heard one time. And so you have to understand, choosing to engage with the language, especially in the public sphere, you know, maybe making that course, maybe just simply announcing that you're learning the language, that helps. We really, really need everything in this age of mass language death, and you can actually help and also inspire many other learners. Because, as I say here, the polyglot communities online are getting closer, and given how few people learn rarer languages, maybe significantly more, once word of this presentation gets out, one mention or one video of one language is enough to inspire plenty of followers. And so one example, in 2013, I made Memrise's first ever Greenlandic course, and now there's a devoted category to it on Memrise.com, on the desktop app. Not, 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 effectively, they took away the possibility to search for the user-generated courses on the, on the phone app. Memrise, you really need to fix that. In all seriousness, yeah, I, I know that sometimes I joke very often, but I'm being completely serious, you need to fix that. Okay, meanwhile, back in the world of endangered languages, 
Many more Greenlandic courses on Memrise have sprung up since, and I have inspired others to investigate Greenland and Greenlandic language in more depth, in part because of Kaverini Nuke Adventures and many other things that I've been doing as well. You can do the same with any smaller language, no matter who you are. Just engage with the language online, mention it in conversations when appropriate, and then curious people will ask questions, and yes, maybe some of them may also want to learn a little bit or get a little bit curious, or maybe actually decide to purchase an album that's actually sung in the endangered language, and that really creates creates engagement, that creates curiosity, and uh, curiosity definitely grows and is even more contagious than the era of the internet than ever before. And you can get other people involved and curious, and so sometimes I've encountered Bretons who speak only French and English and no knowledge of Breton. And so while I've paused my studies of Breton for the time being in order to focus on Fiji, and I may be in Fiji in um, the summer. Um, Fiji is also, Tuvaluan is also a minority language within Fiji as well, and that actually is classified by the UNESCO Atlas as endangered. I've caused many of these non-speakers to really reconsider their heritage for a moment, and many of them have told me something to this effect. So such people might think, you know, if this Jewish guy from Connecticut has no Breton ancestry and has an interest in my language deep enough to learn it and start singing in it, maybe I should really concern tr trying it too. Maybe it wouldn't hurt. Maybe I would learn something. Maybe, maybe I need to be learning it a little bit more than he does. And so that really also creates that, that spark as well. And I also know that some Jews who, didn't, who don't speak Yiddish also sometimes encounter Gentile Yiddish speakers as well from throughout the world. And I've also similarly had their own introspection process on behalf of that. And so, yes, you can actually help. And then lastly, uh, ways you can help preserve endangered languages, even if you have no intention to learn them. One, don't refer to languages as useless. This is a very, very big one. All of us human beings deserve to live. All of our human cultures deserve to live. It's not just simply the big or the powerful or the ones with the most money that deserve to live. We really need to start embracing our humanity and realize that every single one of us deserves a place in the world. And you also, on line with that, realize that every language has value and that each one truly tells a genuine piece of the human story, many of which have been irretrievably lost, but many of which we can certainly continue saving. And you can play a part in that just with these attitude changes, at the very least. Right? Realize that our diversity makes us human and that conformity makes us mechanical. And then lastly, my final point is that there is an ongoing battle for domination between humans and corporations. And so in the late capitalistic system, there's this often idea that, you know, what is useful, what is worth money is better, and then what is small and not worth as much money deserves to be tossed out. And so like, to some degree, there's this idea of, you know, offering humans, offering human cultures and this is this runs counter to who we are as a species and so to some degree yes i think that there are some forms of capitalism that can actually be more compatible with a system in which truly all of us can be very very much appreciated and all of us are very much worth a place on our planet in addition to our cultures and then we have to realize that there is going to be a time in which we will either have to choose to be the conformists that only really care about the big, the money, the mighty, or become the humans that we always really have been for all of our history almost, and the caring ones who tell stories, ones who are artistic, remarkable individuals, all of us who have fantastically deep potential. And we do not get both options. And then finally, in this regard, endangered language learning can actually really save the world. By virtue of the fact with each endangered language that I've learned, in each developing language I learned, all the languages that I've learned, I've really learned to understand exactly the scope of human suffering, the damage wrought by colonialism, the damage that has really been wrought by the chasing profits for the sake of more money. And really, it makes me a better human. With each language that I learn, regardless of whether I learn it to fluency or not, I I'm very deeply pained for the world. And I think that if all of us were to study languages from all throughout the world, among the global languages, the smaller national languages, and the endangered languages, then we would truly be in a fantastic place as a species. And I look forward to that day coming. Okay, so um, here, 
questions, feel free to go ahead and write them in the comments. Uh, my Facebook account is facebook.com slash zogzichnit, which is good for don't worry about that. Email jared at gavarini.com, Twitter, Gavarini official with no L, a world with little worlds at wordpress.com, and YouTube. Chances are you're probably seeing this on YouTube right now. Uh, go ahead and check out my other videos if you haven't already. And then, of course, the end. We have a choice to keep the many cultures in our world alive. This is a sign that I actually did uh, for um, environmental protest march last year. And so we have uh, Kiribati and Tuvalu. Uh, their, well, their cultures and their physical landmass are very much threatened by um, climate change. And so as a result, we really have a choice whether to choose to engage with saving them or whether we don't. And even if you don't have any attention to learn any endangered language, again, that attitude and realizing that all of our cultures have worth counts for something and it's more powerful than you realize. Have a good one and I'll see you next time.